Hey guys, it's Bridgette with San Diego Seed Company, and today I'm gonna talk about seed starting 2.0, what you do after your crops have germinated. But before I get into that, make sure you hit the like and subscribe button so you're notified anytime we put out a video. Okay, so if you guys have watch any of my YouTube videos, you know I've got tons of them on how to start seed. This video is not about that. If you clicked it because you want to learn how to start your seeds, ah, maybe my videographer can put in a way better sound effect, but stop here. Go check out one of our many videos and our online instructions that we have on starting seeds. I want to talk about what you do after you get them germinated. A lot of people, you know, they, they start their gardening journey and they learn how to start seeds and that's awesome. But the second hurdle is how do you get them up to a size that they're healthy and, and really uh, resilient so that they can go out into the garden? That's what I'm going to talk about. I'm really going to focus on fall crops because it's September and I have a beautiful table of all of my fall crops that I'm starting here for our farm. So this is just uh, the tip of the iceberg. This is my first round of succession planting for the farm. I've got sweet peas, I've got cauliflower, I have arugula, tons of different spinaches. I've got lettuce, I've got more spinach, more spinach, I love spinach. I've got some bok choy, I've got some Tulsi basil, even though it's really, really more of a spring crop. You can do a second round in the fall and I love it for my tea. And I've got some onions, okay? So these are just crops that I'm, the, the first round of many that I'm gonna start this fall for our garden and our farm. And let me just give you a little rundown of why I chose these plants. I always try to get people to understand the thought process behind why farmers or gardeners make the choices that they do so that then you can use that same uh, process to make really good decisions in your garden. So obviously cauliflower is a pretty easy one. Cauliflower is a crop that you want to start early in the fall, get it up to a good size to plant it out into the garden, especially if you're in zone 9 and 10, start this in the fall and then it can grow all through the winter. We start it in these trays because it is not a crop that you can typically successfully direct sow. Now, some of you might be thinking, yeah, but you're really silly because you started sweet peas uh, in these little trays versus direct sowing them. You're totally right. Typically, sweet pea flowers would be started by seed directly into the ground. The reason why I did this is because here in San Diego, we get totally tricked every single year and we have these nice cool fall days and then we get 110 degrees. And oftentimes my crops that I direct sow take a massive hit and I don't get good germination because it's really hard to keep a 75 foot row on the farm completely moist the whole time when it's 110 degrees out. So as a safety method, I will start them in trays and then plant them out when I'm sure that we have gotten past most of the extreme weather events that we have here in Southern California. Another crop is spinach. You can also direct sow that crop. I start them again in trays so that I can transplant them out because it's easier for me to keep them moist. You can see here, this is the colibri, which is one of my favorites. And I've got really good germination on it. It looks fabulous. Um, the other crops like bok choy, start that from seed. I will separate that out. I'll talk about that in the video. Basil is another one that is much better uh, planted in a starter pot and then planted out. And then obviously onions and so on. Now, another thing that you might be thinking is, well, you're really silly starting arugula in these, in these starts because arugula is almost a weed and you can so easily start it out directly into the ground. You are absolutely right. The reason why we did this is because I'm silly and actually don't have a good reason for it. So if you have arugula that you're starting, you can start it directly in the ground and it's a, it's a lot easier. My only excuse is that this is an easy way for me to get crops up and started and save on our water bill because I'm only watering this tray versus watering a 75 foot row. Now, if you have taken our online uh, seed starting course, or if you've joined me in any of our numerous classes that we have or watch our YouTube videos, you know that when I do my seed starting uh, spiel and I give all my instructions, I always talk about the pivotal point of when you've actually germinated the seeds. 
that's only half of the battle. Getting the seed to sprout is the first half. The other half of that battle is making sure that you can grow it up to a size that it's healthy and strong so that you can plant it out in the garden. Now, what does that look like? Okay, number one tip that I learned from a very dear friend of mine many, many moons ago, which has made the biggest difference in my gardening and farming career, is knowing when to fertilize. That is so important, I cannot stress that. This seed starting mix that we've used to start the seeds really is formulated for one thing. It's formulated to get the seeds to germinate quickly and evenly. That's about it. It does not have a lot of plant food for these tender, tiny little seedlings so that it can grow quickly and get up to a size that it's ready to plant out. The rule of thumb is for your cauliflower or for any start, is that you wanna fertilize them when you get the first set of true leaves. Now that is very confusing, okay? Because for a new gardener, you might think, oh, here's my first set of true leaves. No, that's just your first set. These are actually called the cotyledons. That is what is inside the seed before it germinates. This is your first true leaf. It is the leaf that looks like the crop that you are trying to grow. These pretty little heart-shaped leaves are the common cotyledons of any brassica. But if you look at this, this really does look like a cauliflower leaf. At that point, if this crop is not getting adequate and regular nutrition, it's gonna stagnate. It's really gonna be stunted. It's not gonna do a lot. So it is my job to fertilize it. Now, what do you fertilize it with and how do you fertilize? Okay, our go-to product for fertilizing, especially when it is seedlings, is a fish fertilizer, either a fish emulsion or a fish fertilizer like this. And the reason why I really like it is because the numbers here are really low, so there's no way that I can burn my precious little starts. If you use a chemical fertilizer, you can absolutely burn and fry your seedlings to a crisp, which is a bummer. So that's one of the reasons. The other reason why is because it's easily sucked up by all parts of the plant. So fish fertilizer can be sucked up by the roots. It also can be sucked up by the leaves, which means that when I go to fertilize, I can be very willy nilly and it, it doesn't matter. So when I fertilize my seedlings, I fertilize every time I water, which means I'm fertilizing very often. Why? That's because these guys are very little they need to be fed often, they need to suck up nutrients often, and they only can suck up so much at a time. So if I give them one massive dose of fertilizer just once, I'm wasting product, I could potentially burn them, and I'm not doing them any favors. Instead, I wanna fertilize frequently with a diluted amount of fertilizer. So I know that this fertilizer is one tablespoon per gallon of water. I'm gonna do about half that. And I've been doing this for years, so I can, I can really eyeball it. The beauty of a product like fish fertilizer is if you accidentally poured a little too much in here, it's not the end of the world. You're not gonna burn your starts. So, i right, turn it on, sorry. So I'm gonna fill up my little watering can here. I really like this watering can because it's so silly, but it's the little things that make me happy as a gardener. It's got a nice little small, small spout so it, I'm not going to drown the seedlings if I accidentally pour too much. So what I love about the fish fertilizer is I water, and you can see I'm getting it on the plants. That is absolutely okay because these seedlings are gonna suck up that fish fertilizer, the plant food, through the leaves and through the roots. So I'm gonna go ahead and fertilize all these. And you can see that I'm, I'm, not, I'm not using a complicated uh, sprayer. You know, I, I'm, just, I'm just adding it to the water that I would normally give these guys. And I'm giving them a burst of energy so that they can get bigger. Now onions are a little difficult because they don't have like first set of true leaves that you can obviously see. But once they're about this tall, that's a good indicator to me that it's, it's, time, to, it's time to fertilize these. You can smell the fish emulsion a little bit. 
nothing like the smell of fish emulsion in the garden. Now that they're fertilized, I know that they're going to get a burst of energy to continue to grow to get bigger. Most of these crops here are way too small to plant out in the garden. If I tried to take these little bok choys, that would be a joke. These would get eaten immediately by earwigs, by roly polies. They're much too small. So I have to wait till they get bigger. One of the ways in which I can help them get bigger is by separating them out. These are planted way too close together. And if I let them grow like this, they're never going to really thrive because they're gonna be competing with themselves. So what I need to do is thin them and pot them up. Potting up is simply the practice of taking a plant that is in a smaller volume of, of soil and putting it in a larger one. On our farm, I try to avoid it whenever possible because it's extra work. If I just plant the crop in a size of a pot that it can thrive in from the beginning, I, yes, I'm using more seed starting mix, but I'm saving in time and energy later by potting up. In this particular situation, because I got so heavy handed with the seeds that I was starting, if I don't pot them up and thin them out, these will not thrive. So basically what I'm doing is I've got some more seed starting mix here. I'm going to take, I'm just taking the stick that I used to, to actually mark it and I'm pulling it up. And you can see that they're pretty small, which is actually a good time to uh, separate them. And I'm just very lightly and gently breaking them apart. And you can see this is all the roots that are in this little tiny start. And I'm gonna try, try as best as I can to not break it. Make a nice little hole here. Stick this one guy in his new home. Try to get him to sit upright. And now he has a new home. This needs to be watered. That's really important because if I don't water it, the dry soil that I just planted this, this tiny little tender seedling in will suck away all the moisture from it and it will shrivel up and die. So it's very important. So let me, let me do a few more here. If you don't mind, I'm gonna, I'm actually gonna do a few here because I wanna water them. So just give me a second. So from one single tiny little cell, I have gotten one, two, three, four, five starts here, okay? It's important to note that that's the, the, the volume of change from this one little tiny area. If I were to leave them in there, then these five individual plants would be fighting for survival in such a small space. They'll never thrive. So now that I have these potted up, what I want to do is make sure that they have plenty of moisture. And so I'm actually just going to put them in their own little tray here. I love these deep watering trays, especially when it's in a hot time of the year because I can guarantee that they're gonna have plenty of moisture. So I'm gonna actually add some water in the bottom here. And I'm gonna do this so that they can suck up moisture up through the pots and stay adequately moist. A pro tip for you is if you're doing any work with your seedlings, whether you're thinning them, um, if you're picking them out to, to thin them or separating them and potting them up, do it in the coolest part of the day. I really recommend doing it in the evening so that the crops are not exposed to any hot temperatures and are because they're they are very tender and young and fragile right now. If I were to do this in the morning and then it was really hot during the day, they likely won't survive this you know, pretty traumatic moment for our seedlings. The other thing that I want to mention is this waterer. So this actual head here, this is called the Dram 1000. And it's called a 1000 because it has 1000 tiny little holes on it. And what makes it really awesome, it is, it is, it is the best tool for watering seedlings. And I'll show you why. It gives this tiny, perfectly soft little rainstorm that you cannot get with a regular spray nozzle. This is a really good tool to use, especially if you're direct seeding because it's not gonna wash the seeds away because it has a thousand little holes. So it's getting a, you're getting a thousand little drips of water, much like a rainstorm would. 
So I'm actually gonna use it to water these guys here. So they're adequately moist. The soil is going to suck up all this water and then as a fail safe, I'm making sure that I have water in the bottom of this tray so that at no point these guys dry out. That's really important. I, I can't stress that enough. This is probably way too much water, but I'm gonna leave it now. It's like six o'clock in the evening. In the morning, I'll come out. These will be adequately saturated. And then the water that's left in here, I can toss into the garden. At any point, if I feel like these may dry, dry out during the day, I can add a little bit more water and that will, that will be sucked up by these uh, little pots as they dry out. So. This is called, um, what is this called? Bottom watering. Bottom watering. This is called bottom watering, and it's one of my favorite ways to start seeds, especially in hot, dry climates, because you have just a little bit more wiggle room and a little bit more room for air. So if you haven't tried this method, I really recommend it. Okay, so that was potting up. Now, if you were here with me right now, we would probably spend about an hour potting up all of the crops that are too crowded in their cells. So that would be this bok choy, this basil needs to get potted up. All of this um, cauliflower here needs to get potted up. Now it could, they could remain in here. It's not the end of the world because I was very careful to only do one seed per cell. So they could continue to be in here. If I, if, if I don't get to them tonight, it's not the end of the world. I've, I've got a little bit of time. But if these are, going to grow to about this size, the size that I want them to plant out into the garden, I will likely have to put these in a bigger pot. These are not very deep, as you can tell. There's only about that much room for these to grow. So it's likely that their roots are going to grow out and, and, and lose and run out of space, basically. So these will need to get potted up. These sweet peas, on the other hand, these are actually just going to get planted out into the garden. My garden is going through a major renovation right now, which I'm super excited about. And that meant I didn't have anywhere to put these sweet peas. We're about done with at least a part of it. And so in the next week when we get cooler temperatures, I can plop these guys into the garden. And you can actually tell just how incredible their root systems are. I mean, look at that. So these were planted August 31st, so just two weeks ago. And they are already, they have this very aggressive taproot that's growing and it needs to get planted out in the garden because it will, it will not thrive in these small, shallow trays that I have here. So I've given a lot of information and I hope it's helpful because this is supposed to be gardening 2.0. What do you do once you get your plants to germinate? And let's just do a quick little review. Number one, most important, is you have to feed your babies. You cannot starve them. They need plant food and they need, they need a lot of it and they need it often and they need it from a good source. Something like an organic fish fertilizer is a great source. Um, something that is water soluble. You wanna stay away from strong, harsh chemical fertilizers that can burn your seedlings. We fertilize every time we water and we dilute it by half of what you would usually use. That process is called fertigation, right? Fertilizing, irrigating. So you wanna fertilize often. You also do not wanna leave your seeds in a tray if they are too crowded. A good example is this bok choy that I potted up. It's too crowded, they're never going to thrive with this many plants in that small of a space. So I have potted them up into a larger size pot and I've separated them so that there's only one per pot. That's very important. Next, ta uh, next tip is that if you're going to do any work with your seedlings, do it in the cool of the evening. Do not do it in the beginning of the day when the plants are going to be hot and go through a stressful experience. You want them to be uh, potted up in the evening when it's nice and cool and you wanna make sure that you put them in a tray of water so that they never dry out. Baby seedlings, when they're this small and this tender, cannot dry out. If you do all of those things, you will very easily get your starts to grow to a size where they're big enough and healthy enough that you can plant out into the garden and they will thrive. I promise you, I've been doing this for over a decade now and that's my secret. Those are the pro tips that I've been using and now you know them so you can use them in your garden.